it's Joyce Conroy. You are on the block party and we are on Ernie's Corner. And today we're going to talk about another band that I'm finding out about. And Ernie is going to share with you their name, Good Thunder. And yeah. Ernie, I had a chance to listen to them a little bit. And they kind of sound a little like Steppenwolf and Uriah Heap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny you should say Steppenwolf because one of the members after this album came out, once it came out, they broke up and they, <laughs> all, they all splintered off into other groups. Uh, L.A. L.A. Uh, I think it's it? L.A. Jets. Yeah. L.A. Jets. And then one of the guys played with Steppenwolf. Uh, I'm not sure which one it was, but we got a chance to meet with them uh, because they were they were pretty much on Elector Records. And, and again, going back a, a step or two, Jack Holzman was the president of Elektra Records. Uh, and he then later sold Elektra to Warner and it became Warner Elektra Asylum. And then Jack went on to uh, to Kenny Corporation, which owned Panavision. And when Panavision's owner who had sold uh, the company to Warner Brothers uh, movies, uh, they put Jack Holzman in charge of running the company. And it was in a real slump because uh, the guy who was who had started Panavision and sold it to Warner Brothers ran Panavision like uh, his name was uh, Bob Gotchak. Robert Gottschalk, and he started, he had a little camera company in Santa Monica, and he developed a lens that competed with Technicolor and Cinemascope, and it was Panavision. And and when he died unexpectedly, they put Jack, who was on the board of Kenny, in charge of running Panavision. And his job, number one, was to turn the company around because Gottschalk had really turned off a lot of people in the industry. Very small industry involved with a lot of money. You know, I mean, there was a handful of players and there was gazillions of dollars. And so Jack, had, his job was to turn Panavision around. I know we're sort of taking a sidestep here, but it all comes together because um, the first thing he did when he took over Panavision was called us. We had worked with him at Electra. We had done some stuff with them. And uh, my partner, Tony, was his, Jack's brother. His two of his children were my partners was their godfather. Tony. And so we had this like incestuous kind of relationship with the Holtzmans and, uh, you know, it, it, it was really kind of great. And so, you know, when we uh, were brought in to uh, do the cover for Good Thunder, uh, their manager, a girl named Chris, uh, had really liked what we had done in the past. She was very familiar because by now this, this album came out in 72. We started working on it. It was one of the early albums that we started working on with, you know, Captain Beyond and some of those other groups. And um, we got a chance to meet with the group. They were recording uh, in LA. They were, you know, with Paul Rothschild, who was a very, very well known. I mean, Janis Joplin, the doors, the list goes on with what, what Paul had already produced. And we got a chance to meet with a lot of producers like Joe Wizard, Bob Ezrin, you know, Jack Douglas. And I remembered their partner uh, was uh, named, uh, well, it was Jack Douglas and Jack Richardson and Bob Ezrin, who had my own productions in Canada and ended up producing all of Alice's hits and stuff. So and Bob Ezrin did. So anyway, we, we it's like this whole uh, group of people that were happening at that moment and good thunder was one of these groups i mean they were really good they were really good musicians and um when they came to us um like i said their their manager chris had really liked the work that we were had done and she was friends with paul rothschild and you know very she she managed the group very micromanaged the group and uh, and that was good because they kind of needed it they were creatives and they just wanted to do music and they needed a business partner that would really watch out for them. And she did. Unfortunately, like we said, the group broke up uh, after the album came out, which was a shame because, uh, like we said earlier, they all sort of splintered off into other bands and uh, which you were, uh, you know, really aware of more than me. I, you knew where they were going. Um, and uh, and so because I didn't really follow their careers. My partner, Tony, uh, was having a relationship with their manager, Chris. So that kind of solidified everything as well. <laughs> um, and and when Electra, Electra was also 
distributing shelter records, which was Leon Russ uh, was uh, was yeah was was it Leon Russ? No, no, shelter records was yeah. I was Leon, Leon Russell. Leon Russell, right? I get them kind of confused. Uh, Leon Russell's uh, and they had the rooster with the Superman upside down Superman logo on their chest, which I thought was really cool. Anyway. Electra uh, was distributing uh, shelter, and Jack uh, was already really good friends with Leon Russell, who I love, man. I mean, and sometime we're going to have shows about album covers that we did that never ended up on the editing room floor. And there was a great one that I did for Leon Russell, Master of Time and Space. It's a great cover with three. It was it. Well, we'll go into that because it's pretty phenomenal. Anyway, um, so Good Thunder was opening. In, in Hawaii, in the main island, they were opening for Leon Russell. And so they flew us all, me, my partner, Tony, my, my wife, Bonnie, uh, they flew us all to the main island and we got to spend the weekend there and have great seats at the Leon Russell concert and, you know, Good Thunder opened for them and they were phenomenal. And, you know, when we got a chance to, uh, when we got a chance to relax. The, the concert was on a Friday. We got uh, on a Saturday. We got there on a Friday and we spent a, a lot of time in the ocean because it was so different. It was warm. We're used to being, you know, out in California, the water's cold. You go to Hawaii, it's like a bathtub. Anyway, make a long story short, we're going to a concert then that we're going to the concert the next day. And that afternoon in Hawaii, Bonnie wouldn't come out of the water. She loved it, and she got a sunburn like you wouldn't imagine. I mean, it was crazy. She looked like Mrs. Tomato. So I'm not laughing at that, Ernie, because I'm thinking about Brian Hyland's itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. You yeah. sure thought he wasn't the one he was singing about? Uh, it must have been. He seen her. She swole up, and she was red. In fact, we we uh, we had a tab uh, on the room for room service. So we ordered like, I think 16 or 17 glasses of iced tea because we couldn't get any tea. If you got a really bad sunburn, you want to put tea all over it or at least sit in a tub with tea. So we got like 16 large glasses of, of uh, tea and put them in a tub with her, kept pouring them over, basing her like a turkey and, uh, and put it all on the room tab. You know, it was great. So anyway, uh, we, we went to the concert, we were into the music and I had gone, the painting that you see behind me is an amazing painting. It's, unfortunately, it's not a really good, I have a transparency somewhere of it, but I, I don't know where it is. And, and I had this, uh, but what you can basically see, this is a, a, a guy that I went to college with. He was the first person that I met when I started at uh, California College of Arts and Crafts, they had a thing where you you sit out the night before you sleep over and you so you can get the classes that you want because it's a very small college, 125 kids. And we were all in line waiting the night before. And Rick Rodriguez and I became great friends. We were right next to each other in the line. And he was an amazing and still is an amazing oil painter. And this was a painting. It's about eight feet long by about five or six feet high and I always loved it I mean we used to party a lot and this was one of the things that we sat in front of and just lost ourselves in it because it's really psychedelic and you got to remember this is now this was in the 60s this is probably 67 68 that he did this painting and uh, when we went to New York, I, you know, Rick gave me a bunch of his work. I mean, pictures, transparencies of them so that maybe I'd get a chance to use them somewhere. And, you know, painters are always looking for opportunities. And this painting was phenomenal. I mean, it, it, it this picture doesn't really give it justice, but like I said, it, it, it was very psychedelic and good thunder was kind of like a psychedelic rock, a progressive rock band. And so when we got the opportunity to do this album, um, I did this lettering and I wanted to use Rick's painting. And so uh, he gave me a better transparency and that's what we ended up using on this cover. And I did this logo and, it, and then on the back, you see the group. Uh, we took uh, my photographer, Lori Sullivan, who uh, was an incredible photographer, shot the Cheech and Chong All American Drug Dealing Game, shot a lot of Guess Who, shot a lot of, uh, uh, in fact, he was the one that went to Flint, Michigan with me when we shot Grand Funk Railroad, uh, when we talked about the Phoenix album. <laughs> 
he was yeah and so we had this great relationship so i had him do this up in the hollywood hills i had him do the shot of the group we put this thing together the other part of this is i had told you before and we had talked about it our biggest competitors was record company art departments and there was this guy um who was the, the um uh, creative director uh at Electra Records. His name was Bob Heimel. And he and I had, uh, before he started at Electra, we had had a couple confrontations. Um, and uh, he had actually, he was a freelancer and I he came and showed a portfolio and I it was really not that good. So I passed on it. And, um, and I think he kind of held a grudge on that. And we had a couple other, we met at backstage a couple times because when we were doing a lot of these bands, we would get backstage either at the forum or the whiskey or the, you know, and, and be able to uh, hang out with the group. And it was always that same group of people that were backstage, you know? And, uh, so he was one of the, Robert Hamill was one of those because you try and establish relationships, which is kind of like, we weren't the only ones that did that in that direction, but we were one of the first ones that did it. establish. Forget about the record companies because they, they're not interested. Try and establish a relationship with the group, with the members, the manager, whatever. And if you look back, even over the covers that we've talked about up to now, uh, you see where a lot of that was true. A lot of it came from Chef Gordon and different managers and, you know, uh, people that were real fans of Pacific Ioneer and what we were doing, believed in it. And so I put this album together. We turned it into Electra, where Bob is the creative director uh, and everything's kosher. And when the album comes out on the credits, he gave the photographer credit, Lori Sullivan. He gave Rick Rodriguez, the painter that did this cover, the credit. And as the uh, creative director, he gave himself the credit oh. and didn't mention Pacific Ioneer at all. Now, this isn't the biggest album we ever did. And in fact, it's one of the smaller groups that we did work for. And it never really got the kind of exposure that it needed to get because like some of these other ones that we've talked about, obscure ones, it had great music. We, it seems like we've talked about a few of those, but they never got their moment in the sun. And even when they did get their moment in the sun, if they couldn't show up every day to re-get that moment in the sun, you sort of fell away. It's like being in a race and you sit down to rest for a minute and the race keeps going. You got to keep, you know, catching up and, 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 you know, usually you fall behind and then the, the, you know, life passes you by. Um, but um, I was really upset because I, we really got close with these guys. We were in Hawaii with them. We were in the studio with them. We, we had really bonded with them and this jerk, uh, left our credit out and so i went to um i went to jack and, and i mean you know jack's running the company i mean the last thing he needs to do is see the the printed stuff or the stuff before it goes to the printer that was bob's job and i i really debated like already there's a a, a real uh hair up his keister about us anyway, do I make it worse? Or, you know, maybe there's gonna be more work coming down the line. And if I don't make a case out of it, maybe we'll get more work. But then I decided, uh, I'm 27 years old, 26, 27, and it's like, screw it. I'm just gonna, this isn't right. What he did isn't right. Uh, he should have given us a credit. He can take the creative direction, uh, you know, credit if you wanted, but album design and concept, concept and design. That's, you know, I don't need to have the creative director credit. But Pacific Ioneer needed to do to get a credit because this is a really nice cover. I did a really nice logo for them. Unfortunately, they didn't do anything after this album, but uh, it was it hurt. It really hurt. And especially you got to remember this is 1972 and Pacific Ioneer is just coming on the scene. We we were getting our name was getting shared, but we were coming on, you know, to the scene kind of like you know, first of all, we we're from New York, you know, and that was a bad thing. And we got over that hurdle 
pretty pretty quickly. But you know, there was all this animosity and and not a whole lot of competition from other companies like ours. Like I said before, there were probably two, probably three, including hypnosis in Europe. Um, so I went to uh, Jack and I told him about it. I took a cover because we had gotten, we went to Tower Records and and got a cover. We didn't, they didn't even get, he didn't even put us on the list to give us one. Oh my. And I, and I didn't get to go on the press check. So a lot of times, you know, the groups would want me to be out there on press to make sure that the end product looks as good as what we presented. And uh, because Printers aren't really designers. They have a hundred thousand of this to print, and then two hundred thousand behind that. And the presses keep to, need to keep rolling twenty four seven so that they can pay for themselves because they're expensive. So you know, the, you know, a lot of people would uh, go to the printer for that kind of guidance. And printers don't care about that. They just need to get this done so the next job and the next job and the next job can get done. So we that was part of our pitch. Uh, uh, and to our credit of what we would do, we do your cover. We're going to, you know, follow it all the way along as far as we can to make sure that it is represents what we're showing you here, because that happened sometimes. It, it, it ended up being kind of goofy, including the Jefferson airplane long, uh, Varen von Tolbruth and the Chrome Nun. We did the, uh, Drew did the illustration. And when they printed the album, they flipped it. So it was back. It was backwards, and I we don't know why. We never nobody ever told us. They just did it, and I think it was a printing mistake myself. But you know who knows? Anyway, that's a whole other story. But you know, so that I went to Jack and I said, "Hey, man, you know this isn't really right. These guys really, uh, you know, deserve the credit as does Pacific Pioneer." And he, I was in the office, and he called Bob in to the office and asked him why. Pacific Ioneer's credit wasn't on there. And he said, because I'm the creative director and those decisions are up to me. And that was it. And Jack just looked at me. I looked at Jack. We both looked at Bob and said, okay, we got an explanation. That's it. Let it go away. And I'm glad I did, Joyce. I'm really glad that we just let it go. After Bob left the office, Jack and I talked about it. Don't worry, other things. And we did an Albert Brooks album and a couple other albums for Jack, cramming it down Bob's throat, which made him hate us even more. Okay, So uh, it's a good thing that we didn't because a few years later, Jack sold Electra to Warner. Warner had purchased Panavision, the camera company, because it was a, a company that fell under their movie division. You know, we were working in music with Ed Thrasher and people like that. And this was in their movie arm, which was a lot more money and a lot. More. And Panavision was the number one camera company in the film industry. It, it, it owned it. And Frank Gottschalk, the guy who owned Panavision and sold it to um, Warner Brothers, uh, was murdered. And they put Jack Holzman in charge of running Panavision. And the big problem that Frank had uh, created was he ran Panavision like Studio 54. If he didn't like you, you didn't get one of his cameras. And you could walk in there with a million dollars and they wouldn't sell you one piece. They only leased their cameras. And that was all part of the the, the glamour and the, and the uh, glitz that Panavision owned in that industry. And Frank Gottschalk was just killing it. So Jack's job one, restore that, you know, thing that we had before with these directors and cinematographers and, and, and people like that who are really the ones that determine whether it's going to be Aeroflex, it's going to be Panavision, it's going to be Mitchell, what's it going to be? Now there's a whole lot more competition with, you know, technology and stuff has evolved. But to this day, you still can't buy a Panavision camera. You can buy all the other ones, but you can't buy Panavision. And we had that account for eight years which was really amazing. We did some phenomenal stuff. And someday we'll talk about that stuff. And I think maybe we did once. We, we actually did. It was very yeah. interesting. Yeah. And it, it just it shows is. you walking the high road, you know, with integrity and how that paid off for you. Yeah. And, it, and life is like that. You know, sometimes you can be too, you can be too quick to react. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always been 
a kind of person that I'll say what I feel. And, you know, my mouth is in gear before my brain. So I get myself into a lot of <laughs> curious positions, but luckily, thank God, I've been able to get out of most of them. But yeah, I've, I've learned to temper that and try to hold it in because of the different things that have happened throughout my career. This was just one. There are many like this where we would have, but this one was the most brazen because he just left us off completely. I know that's such a shame. But then now that we're doing the Ernie's Corner on the Block Party, people are getting to hear the true story behind yeah. it. And that's, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for making that available and possible because, you know, without you and without, and I've said this a hundred times, without you connecting the dots and adding extra dots that help connect them, uh, it would just be me rambling on. We we make a great combination of knowledge and ability and skill and art. And, you know, I'm just honored. I'm very blessed to know you and, and have all our friends on the block here. I mean, they're just wonderful. I hear them from them all the time and, and really great things about how you and I work together and how interesting some of these things are. And, and you know, again, there's a chance to discover a group that I'll bet you most of your listeners would even have known. That's so very true. I've never, I've never heard of them. And then, of course, you get exploring and you start to listen. And Ernie, oh, okay, here comes the mind meld. Okay, all right, all righty. Let, let's see if we are on the same wavelength. We we were very, uh, we were good when it came to you know our last discussion on buckwheat. All righty. Centuries would be the song. Oh my, that is great. It's fabulous. Yeah, and then the other one is I Can't Get Through to You. Those would be the two. But Centuries was really, I mean, again, so talent. It's got to be so frustrating to have all the talent and never get a chance to really have that moment. You know, that moment in the sun that perpetuates you into the next and the next and the next. Alice Cooper is a perfect example of that. I always looked up to Alice for the ability to do that. And even when he had to leave the other guys, they're still friends, but he had to leave them because he and Shep, I mean, here's the thing. They, they saw that the real, the real attractive thing to Alice Cooper was Alice Cooper. And he could be with just about any musician and play, I mean, I, I honestly don't think that he's had songs that were as good after the original group broke up, uh, but he's had some really big hits and great ballads, Only Women Bleed, you know, Welcome to My Nightmare. I mean, he's done some amazing things, but I think that the power and the and the and just the pure power of Alice Cooper was in the beginning where he was so unique, so different, and his music really was amazing. And Bob Ezrin, it's a team of people, just like Pacific Ioneer. We were a team of people that really could stand toe to toe with anybody in any industry. And we did. We crossed over a lot from just the music business to a lot of corporate work and Nestle and Coca-Cola and Kraft and all those different, you know, companies, Rockwell, Honeywell, it goes on and on. So, you know, we, and, and, and like the groups, we broke up too. I mean, the, the movie business took, pretty much every illustrator that we had. So now it was up to me. And so I became the Alice Cooper of Pacific Ioneer and kept on going. And, and hopefully, um, I think, that, again, I think that the album covers and artwork that we did in the music business was amazing from 1971, 69, 70, 70 and 71 to 1984 was, well, actually 1971 to about 19, 78 was the best stuff that we ever did and we've done really good stuff you know since then uh and we'll continue to do stuff in the music business but it was different then it was a different energy it was a different group it was a different talent skill set that made it what it was just like alice cooper there are people that just like alice cooper the early group and don't like anything after you know after welcome my nightmare and beyond they only like the the core group of the original thing. And, and that's where they were the strongest. That's where they were the best. That was where they were the most magical. And Pacific Ioneer has that same history to it. We were amazing for those years. And then then it became me and and putting together other people and, and doing good stuff. But 
that was a magical time. And thank you, Joyce, so much for letting me, you know, have this corner uh, on the block. And uh, it's I'm very honored. I'm very honored and blessed. And, and I'm honored to know you and Tom. He's got a great voice. And I like when he says, let's see what's going on in Ernie's corner. <laughs> it's great. It's awesome. He is such a great voice. You know, and you you two are a great couple and God bless you. Thank you so much. And thank all the, the neighbors on the block here. It's awesome. We just we love having you, Ernie. And I know I keep getting excited about future shows. I've been uh, I like all the teases that you give, you know. So we're gonna <laughs> I am looking for it. I would love to hear, you know, the show all about rejection. I think what we're going to do is uh yep. inspire a lot of uh as I hit this right here, inspire a lot of people because here's a person like yourself who's very successful. You've had your ups and downs as you've described, yeah. you know, like on tonight's Ernie's Corner, but you kept on going. And I know that a lot of the stuff that, that got rejected was probably very good. I mean, that Partridge family comp was excellent, I thought. Well, wait till you see Leon Russell and Janice Joplin and some of these other group bred groups that we did comps for but again, we're, we're butting heads with either the group already had somebody like Pacific Iron Ear or the record company would wine and dine them and just they hated us. We were I mean, we were there. We were we were what they what kept them up at night trying to figure out how to get around. And this this Good Thunder album is a perfect example. It's a textbook example of that. Dislike. Yeah, you know, and, and I understand because I want every job too. I mean, not so much anymore because I'm a little older and know that I don't need every job. But I wanted every job too, and it it just it was a different time. It was a different headspace, and you know, as we get older, hopefully we get smarter. You know, and I and I believe that that I have, and and I've never lost to your point. I've never lost that trust in myself and knowing that. I can do whatever I get confronted with, I can provide a solution for. And there's that confidence in the back of your head. And I've had plenty of rejection. I mean, some of the this misleading things about Ernie's Corners, it looks like everything we did was just, you know, like a walk in the park and everything was great. Mm -hmm. and it was just, but no, no, there's a lot of politics, a lot of egos, a lot of somebody going, well, I'm going to put this I want this to happen and so that they can tell their friends that see that thing there that's what I did and that it's it's really bad in the corporate world because you're dealing with more levels of marketing people strategy people account people all these different levels of people that you need to get approval with and so it became a much harder task and again it but we rose to the occasion with and without the original team in fact I think it got better corporately without the original team and with the headset of, Hey, these are, this is corporate people. We're talking to the same people that goes into the record store, but we're selling them a different product. So it takes a different, you know, mindset to, to do something like that. And, and we were able again to rise to the occasion. And that th this is a true education. It's really wonderful. You know, it's coming to me now, the name of the band member that went on with Steppenwolf, I believe it was Wayne Cook. Who yes. was the, yes. uh, was the band I, member. Yes, they were they were all really talented and they all went on, you know, again, it's it's just sad that you can't get another chance. I mean, you have to make that chance, I guess. And that's what they do. They go off and, you know, like we, we talked to Al Staley about him and his brother and went off from spirit and went on to do Staley brother and went on to do other stuff. So and I think you see that a lot in music. A lot, you know, where they they come together and I just watched A Hard Day's Night the other night. And what a great movie. I had seen it a hundred times that and help. But Hard Day's Night. Three guitars and a drum and they changed the world. How do you do that? How do you do that? And their songs in that movie were just, oh, my God, they sound like they could have been recorded yesterday. And having that feeling of never really depicting an era or a style be versatile be unique so that you can become relevant later on too many people especially artists get stuck in that look and feel and that's them and then the world moves on and that's not relevant anymore so you know i think that one of the things that i've been able to do is be stay relevant and i i try to as much as i can even though i'm getting older <laughs> ah vintage vintage is the word yeah. 
a fine wine, a fine yes, wine. Yes, yes. Ernie, thank you so much. It's always a joy. And I think it, I, that we were talking off mic. I think the five-man electrical band may be in the future when it comes to sure. discussion. They're a big favorite of ours oh, on the I block I loved party. it. They were great. And it was a great story. And then later on, I think we do Watergate Comedy Hour because that is something that's going to be relevant in 2024 with the elections and stuff. And Jack Burns and Avery Shriver nailed it. And uh, it, it's a great story. And, uh, you know, maybe as we get closer to the election time, we can do that one. It's going to be fun. God bless you, Ernie. Peace Same out. Here, Bryce. Love you. Bye-bye. Love you Take too. Take care, everybody. See you on the corner.